for that. Amen. All right, now we can jump in. Now jump we can in. jump in, but we're going to pray first, introduce our guests, and yeah. Yeah. Heavenly Father, uh, be with us, Lord, as we uh, um, tackle this subject, Lord. I pray that um, your spirit would be with us, and I just thank you, Lord, for your love for us, your love for your people, your love, uh, even for those who, who are against you, Lord. Um, you died not only to save, um, you died to save the whole world, and um, we just thank you for that amazing love, that amazing grace. Bless us now, Lord, as we open your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 So, yes. Um, we're going to invite. We're going to invite Sebastian Braxton. Welcome. Did I say Jackson or Braxton? I feel like I said Jackson. You said Braxton. I said Braxton. I know it's, no, no, I know no. it's Braxton, she but I felt like I said Jackson for some reason. <laughs> I'm sorry, Sebastian. <laughs> After all these years, you know I know you. <laughs> so yes, welcome, 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 welcome. We want our audience to... to... Yes. Now, it's hello, really hello. It's good to see you. Yeah, you can just tell. The studio that he's in. The studio that he's in. <laughs> Excuse me. This is like, it just seems like you're just going to bring fire. Yeah, he's going to bring fire. <laughs> he's going to bring fire. Absol absolutely. We don't, we don't want this to go too far out the yeah. building. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. You know, we want to just welcome you back because you are no stranger to Living Manna Church. Uh, you have mm -hmm. you have preached here. You've done divine worship, and people and every every time you come, people are blessed. And so we're just thankful to have you back. We need to know your schedule so you can come back and preach for us again. So send that to Pastor yeah. Myers. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely, it would be a privilege for sure. It's good to see yes. you both. Yes, Amen. it's very good to see you. So go ahead. Where you want to? I've been doing a lot of talking. Why don't you right. introduce well, it? Well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, we um, were, and Sebastian, I think the same thing happened with you where someone sent you a video just kind of out of the blue and was like, you got to see this. Yep. Uh, same thing happened with me. Someone, someone sent me um, the same video. And, and the first video was from a few weeks back, like maybe a month mm, or some, somewhere around there. And um, uh it was getting a lot of views, and in this video, um, there was a pastor who uh, is uh, interviewing with, uh, with a couple that is, uh, you know, pretty well known, and, and it seems like a lot of Adventists know who mm -hmm. they are as well, mm -hmm. and so um, seemed, mm -hmm. seems like a, you know, I didn't know who they were, so, but they seem like a, you know, like cool people. I know people. who they were. Yeah. Because they I seem followed like cool his people. wife. I follow his wife. I've shared her stuff on my Instagram, I and mean, she has a powerful testimony. Yeah. Very powerful yeah. testimony. So they sent me the video, and in the video, they had invited a guest on, um, and this uh, pastor uh, slash apologist was talking about cults. And as he's talking about the cults, he mentions Adventists as a cult. Um, and he begins going through, um, you know, different reasons. Um, we believe that we don't, we do not believe that Jesus is, is God. Um, we... And we're actually going to play a clip, but we're going to play a clip. Yeah, yeah, we we're going to play that yet. clip, but he... He actually, Adventists started coming in the chat and, you know, just a whole lot of back and forth. Um, and so he made a second video. Got a lot of attention. Yeah, made a second video this time, kind of like a seven, eight minute video, just to kind of double down on, on, on what he said and went into a little bit more detail. Trying to give facts and prove what, yeah. to give background on what he said. So we're going to play that video. Just for, um, for you guys to know, and so some of you may not have seen any of this, and we want you to be very aware. And then, yeah, by God's grace, very educated yeah, after. Yeah. And then we'll, we'll, we're going to come back on the other side and start addressing some things. So um, let's go ahead and play that video. Hey, everybody. Hope all is well. Um, Eric Mason here. I wanted to do a, a, a quick, it's going to be a little bit longer of a video. Uh, and so apparently I was on uh, the Perry's, uh, actually we filmed it last year, but um, it ended up coming out this year. I know it went out some kind of way last year. And in a certain segment, I be, we were talking about cults and uh, cults and different cultural ideologies based on um, my last Urban Apologetics book. Urban Apologetics, Cults and Cultural Ideologies. 
And one of the parts of the video, I began to talk about SDA people, Seventh Day Adventists. And, uh, and so it, we didn't think anything of it. And so a bunch of SDA, I guess, apologists kind of went up on YouTube and started to doing a bunch of videos on, you know, Jackie Preston and me and that segment of me calling SDA is a cult. And so when we talk about defining what a cult is, um, I'm, I'm, you know, my, my book is literally by God's grace about that particular subject matter. And I, I, I was excited to do that because I think people need to understand first off, um, page 151. Um, what a cult is and what it isn't. But the main thing is I had three levels. I had a uh, cult, uh, cultic, cultish, cultish, cult, and cults. And so when we talk about cults, the dictionary defines a cult as a religion or religious sect generally considered to be extremist or false with its often, which is follows often living in an unconventional manner under the guidance of an authoritarian charismatic leader. And so uh, and, and, and that's just a an initial definition of it. So I saw one video where they were trying to break down. They didn't even read the book. They got it. They scared to um, to read it. And SDA folks, which we love, like we love you, but you're in a cult. And so when we talk about this whole idea of why we call it a cult, I, I just want to do this video real quick because I want you to answer this question, SDA folks. My SDA friends, I want you to ask this question. Is Jesus Christ the eternal existing co-equal co-eternal son of God or do you use Daniel chapter 12 verse 1 to say he's the archangel Michael I want to ask that question right um I also want to talk about investigative judgment do you know what that is investigative judgment look it up if you don't know because some of you all who are pushing back as SDAs don't know your own doctrine Investigative judgment is 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 the fact that you're not sure of your salvation. Okay, so I want you to look that up. Um, also, in my book, uh, Elsie, uh, shout out to uh, EJ. Um, he talks about now. Listen to this: Satan is a scapegoat and ultimate sin bearer for us. So, and they use the Leviticus passage for that, right? Let's let's read what it says here. Adventists at every level of Adventism. Uh, teach that Satan is the scapegoat and sin bearer uh, referenced in Leviticus 16. Their official doctrinal statement of faith, Seventh-day Adventist believes, his, this is a quote from y'all, a careful examination of Leviticus 16 reveals that Azazel represents Satan, not Christ, as some have thought. This doctrine is closely tied to investigative judgment and is another unorthodox, and I would say heretical, Heretical. Let me put this on uh, sleepy mode uh, real quick. Let me put this on sleepy mode. Hopefully it's still, hopefully it's, oh, oh, it's still recording. Okay. So I put it on sleepy mode because people was texting me. So real quick. And so it says, um, the doctrine is closely related to investigative judgment and is another unorthodox doctrine held by the SDA church. Adventists have tortured scripture Listen, to make Satan a scapegoat because Ellen G. White, look up Ellen G. White, the racist woman in the mid 1800s, who is one of the four parents of the SDA faith. Don't don't act like y'all recanted anything that, that, that Ellen G. White said. Right. Uh, has said the scape, uh, the, the scapegoat um, typified states. And she says, and the author of sin upon whom the sins of the truly penitent will finally be placed. She repeats, Christ will be, uh, will place all their sins upon Satan, the originator and instigator of sin. The scapegoat bearing the sins of Israel went away into a land not inhabited. So Satan bearing guilt of all sins, which has caused God's people to commit will be the will be for a thousand years confined on earth. And so you got here that you all are saying that Satan is the ultimate sin bearer for us. And this is a quotation from your prophet that you all teach. And we're going to do it. We're going to do a big live soon um, because a, a bunch of us with some SDA apologists who are way more advanced in their ability um, to talk through this stuff than I am. But 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 it, but it is very interesting that um that Jesus ultimately isn't seen 
by you all as the ultimate sin bearer. And you go through the entire book of Hebrews and it talks about he uh, 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 um, um, is our sacrifice. Oh, let me just read Hebrews chapter 10. Since the law has only a shadow of things to come and not reality itself of those things, it can never perfect the worshipers by the same sacrifices they continually offer year after year. Like, what are we talking about? For it, it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. Who took away sins? Jesus Christ took away sins. And so anyway, I, I can go on and on and on with this, but we got investigative judgment. Um, not only, I mean, not only, I mean, uh, here we're talking about the scapegoat doctrine. So all of the SEA, and I say this in love. I'm not mad at y'all beating y'all up. We're trying to help you all to come out of, um, this cult. Like, if, if, if you correct me, if you all don't believe this, correct me, if y'all don't believe in this. Now, do you all believe that the Sabbath, that, that Sunday is the mark of the beast? Because Christians worship on Sunday. Listen, Christians never said Sunday was the Sabbath day. And the Sabbath day isn't the only day to worship on it. Acts chapter two, they went to the temple every day. So the, so the, so the people went often to the temple and there were temple teachings going on, temple readings during, I mean, you can go through the new Testament and just see that. So yeah. And so, I mean, I can go on and on and on, but those are the, those are the main uh, few things that I wanted. I'm just peek, peeking at some stuff. If you want more information, my boy, Elsie, has a three volume set. He's a former SDA evangelist and teacher and ordained in their church, in their ministry. And he wrote, he came out of this and he wrote three volumes on it. And it goes into unreal detail about documents that SDA don't want Christian. They are, listen, SDAs are not a Protestant denomination of the Christian church. It is not a Christian church. It is heterodoxy. And it is heretical. Mercy. Ooh. But <laughs> that was long, painful at some, at painful throughout, but important, important to air. Um, because you have to understand for yourself, meaning I'm sure many of you or many of you in the chat are like, what? This is, this is crazy. This is, why is he saying this? And, you know, and all of these things, but you have to be able to understand it for yourself and be able to have it, to be able to answer to people who are, are saying these things. You need to have an answer for yourself. And so that is what the, what the Sabbath school is about. The sermon talking about the scapegoat is going to be about that as well. But it's, it's, again, it's painful to watch and to hear because we're just like, ah, oh, so many things are taken out of context and, and all of these things. Um, but we still need to hear what people are saying and to be able to, again, answer it. So again, that's what we're doing here today. Yeah. So um, I'm going to, you know, I'll jump in and um, just say one of the things I want to say, first of all, is, you know, I've seen in the last several years, a lot of what I call Saul Ministries. Um, and hopefully y'all catch the play on that. Saul Ministries. Saul, ministry. um, Saul was zealous about persecuting this, um. you know, this little group of Christians because he felt he was doing God's will, right? And uh, that's how I look at these people. I don't look at them as, um, you know, like being evil, I think they don't understand what they're doing, but I think that they think that they are doing what is right, mm -hmm. right? And, and I, can, I can respect that. Um, I, I think, I, and I pray that these Saul's will turn to Paul's. And there's prophecy that indicates that those, that very thing will happen, right? Revelation 18. Mm -hmm. um, so nothing against these people. And I think the same thing, you know, when we're talking here, we don't want to be sly. We don't want to be, you know, disrespectful. Um, it's not about that, right? Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that kind of saddens me as I listen to a lot of these Saul ministries, um, Saul before he became Paul, uh, is they often accuse Adventists of intentionally being deceptive and lying. As if there's a school that we go to that teaches us now, here's how you lie about this. And here's how you lie about that. And to kind of put this broad stroke 
against any group of people. It's like saying, oh, Muslims lie mm -hmm. or all right. black people do this or all white people do this. Like you never want to you never want to make a broad stroke against an entire group of people saying, oh, they are all deceptive. Yep. They all lie. That is disingenuous. That is, you know, to me, that doesn't come from a good place. There's something going on in the heart that um, that needs to be checked by the Holy Spirit. So I say all that to kind of set the foundation that, you know, for me, these are my brothers, even though they're like, you know, it's kind of like, Joseph, you're not one of us. <laughs> Joseph, we hate you. <laughs> Joseph, get out of here. It, even though they, they right. kind of look at us as the Joseph, um, we see them as our brothers, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And, and we love them as our brothers. And we're not trying to say, well, hey, he we're he better than too. you. Yeah, yeah he, he said he loves like, us too. So SBS, praise God. we love you. So yeah, we're, we all, love in, we're too. all in love with each other. Right. So let's do the Bible study. But the truth, <laughs> right, the truth is the truth. And I'll say one thing, and then I'll let you, let you jump in here, uh, Sebastian. I was really, sure. really, you know, as Adventists, sometimes we can, we can be at each other's throat for, oh, what do you believe about the nature of, you know what I'm saying? And all this kind of different stuff, the nature <laughs> of Christ and blah, 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 blah. But it was just a beautiful thing to see so many Adventists I have like, to say. no, we're not doing this. It was like, well, yeah, you're I not going to misrepresent, say, I saw a you know, huge community of Adventists yeah. internationally kind of just be like, come to come together uh, to be like, yeah, no, just this isn't, this isn't right. I'm not saying they all knew how to perfectly break it down, that yeah. this is not true, but they knew that it was not right. And so we're going to talk about that today. Yeah. People need answers. And there are some who are like, okay, how maybe I, I feel that? it in my spirit that it's not right, but I don't know how to answer this. And we want you to know how to answer this. That's very important. Yeah. 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 All right. Initial, sure. initial observations, sir. Well, I think... First of all, I love what you said. Um, I think, I think that that's the frustration is exactly what you brought up, which is that you have individuals where a person doing evil who knows that they're doing evil will never have the zeal of a person who is doing evil, who thinks that they're doing right. Mm. So when a person pursues something to that degree, they're going to take it to a whole other level. Mm. And secondly, you have to, give honor and respect where it is due, right? The recognition is that these are not easy things for people to say, especially when he says, look, I love you guys. I'm just trying to bring you back into what he believes to be coming into Christ right. and faith in Jesus and salvation. So who would not be opposed to deception? Mm -hmm. um, I think the, the, the one last observation I will make before jumping into the Bible study is that you also recognize how it's interesting that the source of information about Adventism is coming yes. from someone who is no longer walking with Adventism, Yes, which means there was clearly an, an issue there. And the Bible says in Proverbs that you don't answer a matter before you hear it. Mm -hmm. And so you, you want to sit down and talk to someone who's practicing, who believes it devoutly. Um, if I want to understand Islam, a former Muslim would teach me certain things, but there's a reason why they left. And yeah. mm -hmm. oftentimes their issues with Islam are going to be related to why they left Islam. Right. It, yeah. The same would be true for, for Adventism. So I think um, what I always say when I, as a person who converted from atheism, I didn't want to evaluate Christianity when I, back then it was Yahoo, you know, you Google and you mm -hmm. type in Seventh day Adventist or Ellen White mm -hmm. and all these hate websites come up. Mm -hmm. I knew as an atheist, I'm not going to judge Adventism by those who hate it. That's right. Mm -hmm. So that I, I would never judge my mother by the people who hate her, right? Mm -hmm. I would never, and you don't judge a philosophy by its abuse. Mm -hmm. So we assume that general Christianity has actually had to grapple with this very objection from, from atheists and non-Christian religions. They He's say, well, taken. all of this evil in history was done in the name of Christianity. Mm -hmm. So now we as Christ, as the Christian church broadly have to answer that objection. And undeniably so, we recognize, and rightly so, historically true and factually accurately say, no, that was not Christianity on display, mm -hmm. not biblical Christianity. Mm -hmm. It was a Christianity that had been corrupted. 
Yeah. And it was the understanding of that very truth that shifted me from atheism to Christianity. Yeah. I have to separate those who do things in the name of Christianity, but do not actually live out the principles of Jesus in his life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I think in the very same sense here, as we grapple with this, um, I'm excited for the fact that we go into the Bible and my experience as an atheist and now a Christian for over 22, 23 years Amen. and preaching, the deeper you go into the Bible, the more confident you are that it is the word of God, Amen. the more beautiful Jesus appears and the more powerfully you and I are transformed by the word of God. So to me, when, when, when objections like this arise and, and videos like this are spread and go viral, it is definitely something that, you know, creates an unrest and uneasiness. But at the same token, it's a beautiful opportunity. And God is so loving and so merciful that he saw it's time for us to get back to studying these things. Mm. And I believe by the grace of God, when we finish this Sabbath school time, that we're going to be even more confident in these teachings than we were before this yeah. video was ever posted. Yeah. And that to me is a beautiful opportunity. And that means God is moving. Yeah. Um, because you can never do anything against the truth, but always but for, for the truth. Yes. Yeah. 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 Thank will, you for yeah, saying that. Yeah. There is so much like before we even get into the study, there is so much at the base level that I think needs to be said. Um, you yeah. know, and there's a lot to cover. And we're not gonna be able to cover everything in this, you know, particular Sabbath school. We are gonna deal with the question of Michael, um, his very first yeah. question. But it's it, I, Sebastian, I'm thinking the same thing. I want to know what Sebastian's calendar's like. Can you come back next week too? Because <laughs> I know this. I, know I can this come back. Cool. I can come back next week. Okay. I okay. can come back yeah. next okay, week. Okay, good. We can take our time, guys. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Um, a lot of Christians don't realize that they end up using the very same tactics that atheists use against the Bible. Mm. Yes. And yes. that is, it, it's almost like you're, something goes out the window. Right. When when mm. when we know that atheists will take a whole bunch of Bible verses and say, look, Paul contradicts Peter here. And it's clear to see. Yep. And you can try to explain it to them all day long. Listen, man, that's not a contradiction. You just don't understand. You're not reading it in its context. <laughs> and they're like, we don't want to hear it. It's literally their they they desire so badly for you to be wrong about the existence of God. That it doesn't matter what you show them in the Bible. It doesn't matter, you know, they'll present that the Bible contradicts itself over 100 times. Mm. You know, mm. the Bible says this in Genesis, but it says this in Matthew. And as Christians, we're like, you can't do that. You can't. But then some of these very same people will turn around and use the exact methodology against Adventism. Mm -hmm. mm. You say here, but yeah. the Bible says here. Here is another plain <laughs> contradiction. What more, what need have we to hear any further? <laughs> right? That's right. That's right. And one That's of the right. easiest ways to get, I think, people who are not studying to never give an ear is to be like cult. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. It's the, and yes. That's probably the first thing we need to address, Sebastian, seriously. Yeah. The easiest thing to do to dissuade the average person from ever giving ear is call him a cult. With the word cult on it. Well, by, let me, by let me speak to that. Jesus would have been, Jesus didn't follow the orthodoxy of the church in his yep. day. No, he did not. He was a charismatic yep. leader. And what did, the, what did they call him? You're, you're a cult. Yeah. You're an offshoot. Yep. You're a sect. Mm -hmm. We got the majority. Correct. We're the orthodox. Right. You had the minority, and we can do that all the way through to the dark ages and even talk about Protestantism. Mm -hmm. Because guess yes. what the Catholic Church yes. called Martin Luther Definitely. and Wycliffe? Was it, they called it a cult. Y'all are not teaching yeah. orthodoxy. Yes. So Go ahead. Well, right and, 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 so think about these two pieces that you bring up, right? Because you're exactly right. As an atheist, eventually I have to come to a place of intellectual honesty when I'm evaluating Christianity. You do not judge Christianity by what people say Christianity says. You judge it by what it actually says. Mm. So the first thing is to recognize whenever there is a genocide that takes place in the world, the first step for those who have studied every genocide, Rwanda, Cambodia, um, Germany with the Holocaust, 
the same step is always number one. And that is to dehumanize the other. Mm. So we have to call them Tootsie cockroaches. We have to call them these dirty Jews who take mm. all our jobs, mm. whatever the case may mm -hmm. be. I have to remove them from being a human being. Mm. So the first step here is when I dehumanize you, now I can come with you with a certain vitriol because I'm not doing this to a person. I'm doing this to a cockroach. Yeah. Mm. I'm doing this to a job stealer. Right. So to a liar. that's why Nate. That's mm -hmm. right. So lie. naming people mm -hmm. and labeling them is the first step to in, in order to increase the attack and to gain the fervor and the sort of hypervigilance of the people. But the second step, right, is now. And, and I love the way you 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 sort of highlighted this about using the same arguments that atheists use against the Bible. Because. The saying goes, a mind convinced against its will is of the same opinion still. So at the end of the day, there's a famous saying in Jamaica that says, if a person is honestly mistaken, when you tell them the truth, either they will cease to be honest or cease to be mistaken, mm. but you cannot be both. Mm. So immediately in, in this point, when we start to bring using the same methodology, because our goal is to win. Our yes. goal is to be right, not to get it right. Mm. Mm. So when you look at the, the, the Reformation, why is it that regardless of how powerfully Luther would testify in defense of the Protestant belief in faith and ethic, yet they still would not accept it? Mm. So you're sitting here saying these people were convinced that the brother was right from the Bible. They couldn't disprove him from the Bible. Hence the famous statement. He says, here I stand, I can do no other. Unless you convince me by scripture or plain reason, I cannot and will not recant. So he says it is neither safe nor sound to go against conscience. So for individuals, if your conscience is not a slave to the word of God, people are going to use other methods to convince you, yeah. i.e. Mm -hmm. emotionally charged language, like saying it's mm -hmm. a cult. Right. Mm -hmm. And therefore you now attach a whole bunch of crazy things to Adventism mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because someone used that term. See, my aunt died in Waco, Texas. Mm. Mm. That was a cult. Mm. Yes, it was. So, I'm so, sorry. so I, know I know it because my aunt was writing me letters from inside the compound. Wow. Mm. So, so for me, I understand what a cult is because my aunt yes. died in a cult. Yeah. Yes. So wow. the understanding there is, and this is what breaks my heart is the fact that I was a kid when that was happening yeah. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and thinking to myself, I had not become a Christian yet, but now that I am a fervent Bible student, I wonder if I would have been able to convince my aunt yeah. from the mm -hmm. scripture, yeah. not from, let me use some rhetorically strong language right. to now get you emotionally charged up. And now you're like, oh, now you're looking for me to be guilty. Mm -hmm. And so those are the two pieces. We cannot dehumanize others by labeling them mm -hmm. so that now we don't treat them with the same respect and dignity and in therapy, right? Atante, you would know this, mm -hmm. which is that unconditional positive <clears throat> regard. Yes. So the recognition is if I've already assumed that you're guilty, I will, there's nothing you can say to convince me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. and who's, and this is the last piece, right? Remember in the book of Job, when the devil came and God said, have you considered my servant Job? God said, there's none like him in the earth. He fears God. He shuns evil. He's perfect. Notice the devil's answer was not, no, he's not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which means he couldn't refute Job's behavior. He couldn't refute yeah. Job's per perfection or his fear of God. So what does he turn to? When I can't question your behavior... I have to now challenge your motives, mm -hmm. but does he fear you for nothing? Mm -hmm. So a sly accuser understands that. And that's yeah. why you see them using the same tactics because the goal is to be right, not to get it right. I yeah. got to figure out how to convince people. But the reality is you can't refute Job's behavior. You can't refute the truth and the verity of what people are saying. So what do you do? You attack the motive. They're deceptive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They're lying. They're going to tell you this and try to tell you that. 
Yeah. And it's fine. So, no, if you try that in a relationship, you won't be married for very long. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so let me address one more thing. And I promise you, you know, please understand this is, to me, this is foundational, right? Mm -hmm. So, and I was thinking about this and someone actually brought it up in the chat. They're like, but Adventists call the Catholic Church Babylon. Mm -hmm. So this is, you mm -hmm. know, double speak. And let me speak to that just for a moment, because we are very careful as a church. Now, unfortunately, yeah, you got ministries that will, you're a Catholic, you're a demon. Um, and that's unfortunate. <laughs> that's you know what I'm saying? That, that's, I, I cannot deny that. Mm -hmm. But as a church, our position with a we say it is the system and not the people, mm -hmm. right? Correct. We're saying, look, the system is in error. And we don't have a problem with people saying to us, hey, your system is in error. Okay, well, let's talk about that. But when you start saying the people are lying, they are deceptive. Oh, the teachers. The no, you mm -hmm. know, I, like, I don't believe the Catholic Church is, the Catholic Church isn't lying when they say we believe that we have power to change God's word. They're telling the truth. This is their actual conviction, right? Mm -hmm. So we don't yes. go around saying, yeah, beware of those Catholic, you know, beware of those Catholic people. It's a different thing altogether. <laughs> so we're not saying you have to agree, right, that, oh, what we're teaching is truth. But to make a broad stroke of they are lying and, they're, and if they say this, they're not really using the right words. They're, they're talking double talk. Then you've just yeah. disqualified us from you. We can't even use language because now if I say... I believe Jesus is God. Well, what do you mean by God? Oh, I mean like divine. <laughs> yeah, what do you mean by divine though? Nah, you're lying. Your divine is not what my... And now we can't even have a conversation because you just told the people whatever words they use, don't believe them, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Because they're lying, because they're double mm. and they're trained to do this. It's almost like a conspiratorial approach you're putting in the minds Naturally. of other people and saying, no matter what they say, they're lying, don't believe them. That is the difference. We believe that most of God's people are in the Catholic Church. That's yes. what we believe. So while we believe that God, that that, that system is corrupt, the mm -hmm. system is corrupt, we believe there's that God has genuine, there. sincere, sincere people there. Christians. Yeah. Even though we believe their doctrine is, is almost 100% off, Mm -hmm. We're not like, oh, they're not Christians. That's a right. huge thing to be like, hey, I'm a believer in Jesus. And you're like, no, you're not a believer in Jesus and you're not a Christian. That's a huge, huge, <laughs> like, what? Are you God? You know, so. Well, but Ivor, but Ivor, you got to keep in mind, we live in the time of social justice, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? Now you're, now religion is being categorized as a social injustice. Mm. So I'm bringing that same energy when it's George Floyd, I'm bringing the same energy when it's human trafficking. I'm bringing that same energy to religion. Mm. So now we're going to come and I'm going to attack it with the same vitriol yeah. that I would have okay. over here because I yeah. feel like it's an injustice. And I understand yeah. I was that type of atheist. I'm like, mm. you're over here talking to people about Jesus, which in my mind as an atheist, he's no different than Santa Claus. Mm -hmm. So you're giving people false hope, hope. for something that's yeah. not true. So, of course... I'm going to bring that same fire to it, but we understand, as Jesus said, people will persecute you thinking they're doing God's God. will. Yeah. Jesus already told us this was going to happen. Yeah. And they did the same thing to him. They yeah. said, it's better for one man to perish than for the whole nation. Yeah. So yeah. We, we, we cannot be surprised. And also look at the book of Acts. Gamaliel said, if this thing is of God, you can't stop it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if it's not of God, it'll come to nothing on its own. Yeah. So you don't need to fight it. Mm -hmm. So in either camp, fighting something is never the solution. Mm -hmm. Because if it's from God, then you're fighting God. If it's not from God, it will actually fail on its own. Yeah. As yeah. every movement that is not led by Jesus always does. Because he yeah. says his church will, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, all right. Yes. What, yes. A, what an introduction. It is, but I guess it was a needed introduction. <laughs> Very for needed. Foundation, for yeah. Foundational. And um, I know everyone is here to, to, to take a deep dive into the word. 
and to see, yeah. okay, I know this isn't true, but let's prove it from the word of God. Yeah. Or maybe some are here like, I'm not sure if it might be true. So yeah. I don't know. You know, let's let's yeah. let's take a look. Right. I mean, there's all different people here looking for yeah. different so, answers for mm -hmm. truth, but for different reasons, yeah. you know. So we wanna we wanna jump in. We so wanna jump in. Let's begin with Michael. And we'll probably okay. spend spend our time just yes, the rest we'll of the time on Michael. Michael. Um I wanted to get to the investigative judgment and this whole idea of we're not, we don't have any assurance of salvation. But, uh, we'll, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, Michael, now um, let me say this first. I'm um, very sure of my salvation. Not because of me, but because of Jesus. I know. I know. <laughs> Amen. I, yeah. When I hear people say that, I'm like, no, that's, anyway. You're going to make us start on, the, on the, the assurance of salvation first, aren't you? Listen, because if no, you go I, too far, then we're going to have to... to all right, so let's talk about Michael. One of the things that really kind of disturbs me when I hear people say, oh, they're a cult. Why? Because they believe Jesus is Michael. Is I'm just like, have you studied, have you studied this subject? Or are you echoing mm. in the context of where we are into, you know, where we are today? Are you simply echoing what you've heard other people say because, oh, that's not a popular belief? Mm. Have you seen what others have said about the identity of Michael. And my thing is this, listen, if you're going to call Adventism a cult because we believe that Michael is Jesus, you must also call, and we'll just do this one by one, John Calvin, a heretic. Yep. Let me just read something from John Calvin real quick. Michael may mean an angel, but I embrace the opinion of those who refer this to the person of Christ because it suits the subject best mm. to represent him as standing forward for the defense of his, of his elect people. Now, re regardless of... I just want to say, just for those who... You said Calvin. That was from Calvin, right? That was John Calvin. John Calvin. Yeah. Okay. Just for some who yeah. may not even know who that is, just say... <laughs> I'm, I'm here for those who... Uh, yeah. If you're a may, Christian, you yeah. know who John Calvin is. Okay. Yeah, reform well, church. That's what I'm saying. Absolutely. They should. Yeah. They should. Now, I'm not saying, I'm not even saying, hey, John Calvin is right or John Calvin is wrong or we're right or we're wrong. What I'm saying is be consistent. If you're going to say that this teaching means that we are a cult, you must also say that John Calvin himself is a heretic for holding this teaching. Okay. Mm. Bottom line, mm. you must be ready to go live and say, yep. John Calvin was heretical here. Yeah. But it doesn't stop at John Calvin. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to pause no. right there for a moment. Because to me right now, it's not even about, let me prove to you that Michael, that Jesus is Michael and that Jesus is also the son of God and Jesus did not have a beginning. The principle is, by the standard you laid out, please also condemn these other individuals as not being Christian and also not believing that Jesus is the son of God. Mm -hmm. Which, by the way, guess who subscribes to that Protestant line of theology? Charles Spurgeon. Want to read it? The Reformed Church, the Dutch Reformed Church. So now all of a sudden, right, we again, this is why I say about labeling and dehumanizing. <laughs> because... The moment like you're going and, I, and I'm sure there's more even on the Jewish side. So now you go to this level to say, hey, we're going to start using this as a as a talking point. But yes. to find out a good amount of Christianity actually sides with that opinion. Protestant Christianity, Protestant Christianity. You have a, you have any statements from from um, Spurgeon? I have one right. Uh, no, I don't have. <laughs> OK, I don't have it right in front of me. So this is from the Angelic Life, um, 1868, part of a sermon called The Angelic Life. Our Lord, here is Charles Spurgeon. He's in every pastor's library. Protestant. Protestant pastor. Library. Our Lord is called an angel. He's the angel of the covenant. We read that Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and his angels, or I'm sorry, Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and his angels, and the dragon was cast down. The fight is going on every day. Michael is the Lord Jesus, the only archangel. Mm -hmm. I am not arguing right now whether that is true or, or not. That's, to me, that's irrelevant to what he was bringing up. 
It is relevant. It is relevant. Yes. But what I'm saying is be consistent. Mm -hmm. Be ready to dismiss Charles Spurgeon as being a genuine Christian. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Go public with that. Yeah. Spurgeon, not a Christian. He didn't believe that Jesus was God. He didn't believe Jesus was God. So now we've got to ask, yourself, ask ourselves the question, are you saying then that Spurgeon believed that Jesus was a created being as well as Calvin? <laughs> now right. look, whatever explanation you're going to give, because what you're going to do is you're going to defend Spurgeon and you're going to defend Calvin. You're going to be like, well, no, see, you got to understand what they were saying was whatever they were saying was, that's what we're saying. Mm -hmm. mm. Mm -hmm. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Go. You got I mean, it. it's you, so I just wanted to let that breathe for a minute um, because the, the importance of what you're saying cannot be overstated. And these are individuals who came to those conclusions by study. Spurgeon and Calvin didn't just make those comments willy nilly and just off the cuff. Oh, yeah. The mic was thrown in front of his face as he was walking to the car to go meet his kids for their birthday party. Mm -hmm. Hey, Calvin, do you have any thoughts on Jesus as Michael? No, he's preaching a sermon and documenting his theological thoughts. Spurgeon preached that sermon who was a preacher whose whose prayer meetings were packed with three to five thousand people on mm. Wednesday. Mm. Mm. So anyone at that time could have said, oh, man, this brother's losing his mind. Yep. He's going off. When in reality, it was not an uncommon Protestant denominational belief that Jesus and Michael were the same person. They were not. So yeah. I want to I want to start with with this sort of idea to get into the Bible, because I, I can see Atante is chomping at the bit. Well, no. <laughs> so, well yes, you're, listen, we're, we're, we're going to jump you, right into what you, you wanted. Yeah, you continue. You go in the Bible, and I, I'm just going to okay. stick with some history here. All right? So you go okay. Bible, I'm going history. Go ahead. Sounds good. Sounds good. So if we, if, we, if we look at Michael, Michael as a celestial being appears in five places in the Bible. So... Let's start with the first place that he appears, which is in Daniel chapter 10. So if we look in Daniel chapter 10, in verse 13, this is Gabriel, who we know from, John, from chapter 9, is Gabriel in 8, who's been talking to Daniel. Now, Gabriel is trying to get to him, and this is what he says, in beginning in verse 12. Then he says to Daniel, do not fear, Daniel, for from the first day, that you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard. And I have come because of your words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. And behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I had been left alone there with the kings of Persia. Now, he goes on to his explanation, and then verse 21 of the same chapter, he ends by saying, I'm going to have to go back into conflict again. And then he says in verse 21, but I will tell you what is noted in the scripture of truth. No one else upholds me against these people except Michael, your prince. Hmm. So in Daniel chapter 10, it can be easy to su suggest that in these verses, Michael is identified as supposedly just an angel. Mm hmm. So scripturally, we see in Daniel chapter 10, he's like, well, here's a celestial being who is trying to come answer Daniel's prayer. He's withstood. We understand that he's not withstood by human armies mm -hmm. because we read the story of Hezekiah. One angel could kill 185,000 men in one night. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we don't have a problem with angels are not being withstood by human armies. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? So that's not what yeah. we're talking about. He's talking about a spiritual battle, and that's a Protestant understanding of the passage. Mm -hmm. There's a spiritual battle, and that prayer is intricately connected to this spiritual conflict mm -hmm. between good and evil. You're praying, and God commissioned Gabriel to come answer Daniel's prayer, but he was withstood spiritually. Mm -hmm. So he was stuck for 21 days, could not get progress, so therefore who came? Michael came. Michael. So whenever you see Michael in the Bible, in Daniel chapter 10, 
you could easily look and say, oh, well, he's your prince. That's what mm. the Gabriel said to Daniel. Mm -hmm. He's your ruler. That's a message. Then when you come. Sermon. <laughs> exactly. Then when you go to chapter 12, Daniel chapter 12 in verse 1, the next time it says, at that time, Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the, over the sons of your people. There shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. And at that time, your people shall be delivered. Everyone who is found written in the book. So now Michael is mentioned again by the same angel. Mm -hmm. And he says, Michael, again, who he said was your prince, who came to help Gabriel in a spiritual battle. Now he's saying, guess what? When he stands up, the dead are going to be raised. All of a sudden, these things are going to happen. Here are the events that are going to happen when Michael moves. Mm -hmm. So first of all, there's going to be a time of trouble. That never was until that time. The second thing that's going to happen is God's people will be delivered. Mm -hmm. The third thing that's going to happen when Michael stands up is people who sleep are going to be resurrected. Mm -hmm. Some to everlasting life and some to everlasting contempt. Mm -hmm. Then he goes on to say, and those, you know, he talks about those who are wise, they're going to receive these everlasting rewards. This is all because Michael stands up. So he's already been to called me, your a, prince. That, that verse right there, that whole thing, I'm sorry. This is what I was biting at the bit earlier to, to bring up was, to me, that's yeah. a mic drop right there. That whole passage is a mic drop. Like we know that if, when Michael stands up, that that that's you know and into the world is is happening like that's that's it right yes. and so that's not correct just a basic angel no that's god no that's so Jesus. so to build off of your point atante then i want to hand it back to ivor real quick so i'm going to make two quick points the first point here is this i'm going to deal with the angelic part after you go through some more history but i want to talk about just about michael functionally in the book of daniel the first time he's ever mentioned so the Bible says in verse one that he says at that time, Michael shall stand up. That word for stand up, Ahmad in Hebrew is used throughout Hebrews, uh, used throughout Daniel chapter 11, which Daniel 12 is actually a continuation of Daniel 11. Mm -hmm. Right. So the chapter divisions is unfortunate, but it's not accurate yeah. because he says at that time. Well, what time you'd have to go back to Daniel 11 verse 40, mm -hmm. where he says the time of the end. Mm -hmm. So now at that time, Michael will stand up and that word Amon, which means to stand up, to ascend as a king and mm -hmm. to conquer mm -hmm. and to reign. And the same word is used six times in Daniel 11. So here's the difference you have in verse two, these kings of Persia, four of them will come. Then you have the king of Greece. He's going to stand up. Then you go to verse 20. Verse 33, stand up, a new king, a new king is ascending. Now at this time, a new king is ascending. And what's that king's name? Michael. 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 So there's a military royal ascension. But guess what? There is no one that stands up after Michael. Nope. <laughs> That's another <laughs> mic drop. There's just mic drop after mic drop. <laughs> yeah, so nope. there's no one. Yeah. Whoever, who, whoever this entity is, he is the final ruler on the earth. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. When he stands up, there's a time of trouble and God's people are delivered. Right. That's the correlation with his actions. When he becomes the king, when he takes over the affairs of the world, God's people are delivered. The second yeah. part of that verse. Go ahead. I was just going to say, we understand that Daniel 2 and Daniel 12 are like bookends. So if we take yes. Daniel 12 and bring it back to Daniel 2. What Daniel 12 is describing in great detail is the final event of Daniel 2, where the stone, cut out without hands, destroys all the other kingdoms. Yep. And who is yep. the king of that kingdom? Who is that rock? Whoever that rock is, take it back to Daniel 12. It's the same thing. Parallel. They're yes. bookends. That's exactly right. So... Then you have, the Bible says, at that time, Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands for your people. Mm -hmm. So now there's two times the word Amon is used in this verse. Mm -hmm. The first time is at that time, he's going to stand up. He's going to ascend militarily, royally. He's now the king. Mm -hmm. He's now conquering. Mm -hmm. Then it says the word again 
But now you're talking about in a context of judgment. So now you're saying, wait a minute, he's standing up for your people. Mm -hmm. So to stand in general is just to ascend and become a king. Mm -hmm. But when you're standing for someone, uh, that means you're actually standing in defense of those individuals. Yes. Mm -hmm. According to my Bible, there is one mediator mm -hmm. between God and men. Mm -hmm. That is the man, Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. So if Michael yeah. is standing for us, then he's doing the job of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And as... The blind man said, whether wow. he is a sinner or not, I don't know. But there's one thing I know. I was blind and now I see. I see. And then Jesus asked the blind man, do you believe on the son of man? He said, tell me who he is that I may believe on him. Mm -hmm. You can call him Michael. You can call him Jesus, you, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> but whoever this person is right now in Daniel chapter 12, he's actually standing for me. And here's the last piece. And I'm going to hand it over to you, Ivor. So four times the word time is used in this verse. So it's interesting how they structure the time in the verse. So at that time, Seist in Hebrew, Michael stands up. So that's the first time. Mm -hmm. And then the great prince who stands over the people and there shall be a time of trouble. So now we have this time when Michael stands up, then we have this time of anguish. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that time, that time. Mm -hmm. yes. so now we're paralleling the time of anguish and that time are the same time mm -hmm. then notice what happens and at that time your people shall be delivered mm -hmm. so he's showing to you that god's people are delivered is the same event as michael standing up yeah so mm -hmm. there's a time of anguish that's the focus of it but the book ends is the fact no matter what time of anguish, no matter what time of trouble that never was since there was a nation, we will be delivered, which is exactly parallel to the actions of Michael standing up in the very first part of the verse. The same phrase at that time, mm -hmm. God's people shall be delivered. Mm -hmm. So the question here is, is that he stands for the people. He's fighting for Gabriel so that he can come answer Daniel's prayer. Gabriel tells Daniel, he's your prince. And now he's ascending to the throne and he's ruling, yeah. militarily conquering and standing for you in judgment to represent you. Mm -hmm. So we understand that the only person who fulfills those responsibilities in the Bible mm -hmm. is Jesus. Yeah. Right. So here's a, another thought. Let me just add to that real quick. Because the Bible, were you going to say something? Well, I was going to ask a question somebody's asking because I okay. think it's, you know. Okay. Well, I, let me add this. Go I'm going to do some history. Then we'll go to that question. Okay. Um, yeah. When Jesus descends, um, it's interesting. We know that it is the voice of Jesus that raises the dead. Mm -hmm. John chapter yes. 5. Um, the dead will hear my voice. The voice of the Son mm -hmm. of God. But then we have in 1 Corinthians... Chapter 15. I'm sorry. Is it 15 or is it Thessalonians? Yeah. First Thessalonians. You talking about the voice of the archangel? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. First Thessalonians. Yeah. First Thessalonians 4.16. 4.16. Yeah. Yep. And uh, first Corinthians 15 is where, you know, he, he descends and they're transformed, translated into. Mm -hmm. We can put both of those verses together. Does he need somebody else's voice to raise a dead? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Why is he coming, the Bible says, with the voice of the archangel? Not the body of the archangel, but with the voice of the archangel. So that's very interesting. Why? Like, does Jesus, when he is like, you know what? I would do this by myself and raise him from the dead, but I can't do it in my voice. So I'm going to borrow, I'm going to grab the voice of the archangel. The text is not saying that. No. What the text is saying is that it is the voice of the archangel that raises the dead, mm -hmm. which parallels right back to Daniel 12. He's not coming yes. with the archangel. He's coming with the voice of the archangel, meaning the voice of the mm. archangel is his, his voice. voice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm. Let, mm. Let's, 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 how many of you know John Wesley? Put a one in the chat if you know John Wesley. You know John Wesley is. And then put a two in the chat if you think John Wesley is a heretic. <laughs> while you're while you guys are getting there let's let's do this i want to read a couple commentaries um john wesley on daniel 10 13 
Michael here is commonly supposed to mean Christ. I remain to counter. Oh, I'm, I'm, let me just stop right there. Michael here is commonly supposed to mean Christ. Daniel 10, 10, 21. Michael, Christ alone is the protector of his church when all the princes of the earth desert or oppose it. That's John Wesley commenting on Daniel chapter 10, verse 13, verse 21. Here's, here's Wesley on Daniel 12, verse 1. The meaning seems to be as after the death of Antiochus, the Jews had, had some deliverance. So there will be a greater deliverance to the people of God when Michael, your prince, the Messiah, shall appear for your salvation. Mm. That's John Wesley on... Daniel 12, verse 1. How about John Gill? John Gill. <laughs> Every pastor that I know of should have John Gill's commentary in their library. It is very well known. John Gill says, as far as Michael standing up, the archangel who has all the angels of heaven under him and at his command, the Son of God, our Lord Jesus Christ, who is as God, as the name signifies, truly and really God, and equal in nature, power, and glory to his divine father. When we say that we believe that Michael is Jesus, we are not saying what our brothers over at the Jehovah's Witness organization say, that yes, he's Michael, but that means that Jesus is not God. He's a mm -hmm. created being because angels are created. That's not what we're saying. No, mm. no. no. We're saying what all. John Gill is saying. Right. We're saying what John Wesley uh, Wesley's saying. We're saying what Calvin is saying. Mm -hmm. We're saying what Spurgeon is saying. Mm -hmm. If you're going to call us a cult because of that, be prepared to also call these men heretics. And why not include Matthew Henry, who also says, Michael signifies who is like God, and his name with the title of the great prince points out the divine savior. Christ stood for the children of our people in the stead as a sacrifice and bore the curse for them to bear it from them. So let me say this. I've noticed that when people throw out this idea that, oh, Adventists made this teaching up and they're the, they're either, I want to be careful how I say this. They're mm. either totally ignorant that this was the common teaching among Protestant churches. And ignorance is just not knowing. Yeah, ignorance is just not <laughs> knowing. Right. I'm not saying ignorant in a <laughs> right. bad way, mm -hmm. right? Or this is the more diabolical thought for me because I'm just like, it's strange to me how you can study so many things about Adventism, but never have thought to study, well, what do other people say about Michael? Right. Oh, well, let me take that off the table then because of Matthew Henry and Calvin, all these guys believe that then. Yeah, maybe I don't believe it, but I wouldn't call them heretic for believing it. So I'm just not, I'm going to remove that from my arsenal of why Adventists are a cult. Right. Let me just not use that one. Mm. I'll use investigative judgment. I'll use, you know, uh, what they believe about the state of debt. But let me take that one off the table. Right. That would be mm. a genuine, mm -hmm. you know, that would be genuine. Mm -hmm. Like, right. okay, okay, okay. You I want to throw this. Oh, go ahead. I'm going to do one more thing. Okay. The Geneva Bible was the Protestant Bible. Let me talk about what the Geneva Bible says regarding Michael. And then I end with this quote. The angel here notes two things. First, that the church will be in great affliction and trouble at Christ's, second, at Christ's coming. And next, that God will send his angel to deliver it whom he here calls Michael, meaning Christ, who is proclaimed by the preaching of the gospel. This is the Geneva Bible, the English translation of the Bible, published in Geneva in 1557, backed by such people as Miles Cloverdale, John Knox, John Calvin. This is in the footnote of their Bible. Mm -hmm. How are you so unaware that this was basic Protestant teaching. It's not now, and there are reasons for that. But we're not gonna get into all that right now. <laughs> the bottom line is, if this is what Protestantism was founded on, we still hold to this. Mm -hmm. right. Meaning, as far as this goes, 
Maybe, maybe nothing else in far as far as this goes, we're Protestant. We can say, hey, we're Protestant here. Because this is what the Protestant reformers taught. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One thousand percent. Sorry, Atante. Go ahead. No, it's okay. <laughs> because if I I don't ask this question because it keeps yeah. this keeps going up. Okay. Can it just be that Michael is just an angel who heads the military and not necessarily Jesus? I feel like everything yeah. you guys have been saying yeah. Let, is Yeah, let me jump in. No, here I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna go ahead. go ahead. I'm gonna make this quick. If you go back into the Old Testament, and it's interesting how m most Protestants don't have an issue with this. When in the book of Exodus, chapter 3, when God appears to Moses, the Bible says the angel of the Lord appeared to Moses out of the burning bush. Mm -hmm. And when Moses mm -hmm. turns aside to see who this angel of the Lord is, the angel speaks and says, I am the God. What is your name? I am that I am. Mm -hmm. Yep. When when Isaac is about when uh, when Abraham is about to Jacob. sacrifice Isaac, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh yeah, Abraham. When, when, Go ahead. When, yeah, when Abraham is about to sacrifice Isaac, the angel of the Lord calls out to him and says, "Stop! For now, I know that you fear me." Mm -hmm. Who is the angel of the Lord here? The angel of the Lord is Jesus. That's who's speaking. Mm -hmm. He says, yes. it's me. He's actually speaking in the first person. But strangely, once we put a name to that angel of the Lord, Michael, now it's like, oh, it can't be Michael. But he has a name. And the name is not Jesus in this sense. Jesus was the name given to the Son of God when he became a man. God with us. Mm. Therefore, right. his name wasn't Jesus in heaven. Yeah, right. It was God. We weren't even around. <laughs> right? So, and right. he was not with us in the flesh. Jesus is the, is the, human, the human name mm -hmm. of the divine savior. So what was his name? Is it just, you know, God? Yeah, we know Jehovah. We know Yahweh. Michael, the one who is as God. Mm. That's what the name literally mm. means. Mm. So if the Bible describes mm. Jesus as an angel and you look in Protestant in, in, uh, a, you look in commentaries, just go back and look who's this angel of the Lord. And they will say without shame, oh, that's Jesus. That's Jesus. That's Jesus. Yes. But now we put a name to him. You think Jesus is an angel. Blasphemy. Right. That's contradictory. Right. Mm -hmm. All right. Go ahead. It's true. So let me build off of your point. I'm going to start with the broader point and, and get specific. So with some other texts about Michael. The problem starts with the idea that we seem to assume that every time you see the word angel, we assume that it is a creature mm -hmm. that was created by nature. So angels, right, which Hebrews 1.14 tells us they are ministering spirits. And Hebrews 1 clearly sets Jesus aside from the angels. He says, unto which of the angels did he ever say, this day I have begotten you. He never said that to an angel. So Hebrews 1 is trying to establish the difference between Jesus and the angels. So the idea then is if the angel of the Lord is God, then now we must change our idea from seeing the word angel as a creature mm -hmm. to angel as a function. Yes. So in the Hebrew, it is the word malach. In, in Greek, it's angelos. So the word, the book Malachi means my messenger in Hebrew. Mm. So now in, in Malachi chapter three, he says, oh, my messenger, who was who? John the Baptist, who came before him. Then he says, he's now proclaiming the messenger of the covenant, who is Jesus. Mm -hmm. So they're both Malachs. They're both That's messengers. Right. They're both angels in the Hebrew. Mm. That's right. Mm -hmm. So we have to change our understanding from always assuming an angel is an creature a spiritual being that's to angel as a function that's correct so that means this right and this is how i summarize it so the bible presents it as a function as any being whether human whether angelic or in this case divine functioning as a messenger yes mm -hmm. so now you're recognizing let's look at this right so let's look at a text with 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 michael to harp on this point and i'll connect it to the angel of the lord so if we go to Jude 9, 
Mm-hmm. And Jude, the book right before um, the book of Revelation, the Bible is talking about not making accusations. He's talking about these false teachers. And he says, beginning in verse 8, Likewise also these dreamers defile the flesh, reject authority, and speak evil of dignitaries. Yet Michael, the archangel, this is the first time he's given that title. Mm -hmm. The archangel in contending with the devil. So you notice every time I'm going to bring up the next three texts, he's always contending with the devil. Yep. Mm -hmm. It's always Michael and Satan. Yep. Mm -hmm. So it says Michael in contending with the devil when he was disputing about the body of who? Moses. Yes. Yeah. Every time Michael is mentioned, it's before the incarnation of Jesus. Mm. Mm. So we're going to see in Revelation 12, there was war in heaven before the incarnation of Jesus. Mm -hmm. We see in Daniel 10 in 12, it's before the incarnation of Jesus. Mm. Now we're in Jude. He's disputing over the body of Moses. You can say, Sebastian, how do you know that this took place before the incarnation of Christ? Because on the Mount of Transfiguration uh -huh. in Matthew 17, yes, Moses that. came okay. to, see, to see Jesus. Mm -hmm. So right. clearly the dispute over his body had already been settled. That's mm. right. So now at this point in time, Moses and Elijah come to see Jesus on the mountain. So in this very moment, we know now Moses has already been resurrected. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Jude is telling us there was actually a spiritual controversy mm. yeah. between Michael and the devil. And notice what he says. When he disputed about the body of Moses, he dared not bring against him a reviling accusation. Mm -hmm. So when he's arguing with him, he doesn't make an accuse statement. Mm. He doesn't say you're a slanderer. He doesn't say you're a liar. No accusations are brought when they're disputing. Mm -hmm. And notice, like we just said earlier at the beginning of this conversation, if we're going to dispute about doctrine, about belief, about Be investigative careful. judgment, Be that's careful. fine. But you don't have to bring accusations because even Michael, even when arguing with the devil, with didn't bring devil. an accusation. Mm. You are mm. So now, what does he say instead? Notice what he says at the end of verse 9. The Lord rebuke you. This is what he says. So he says, the Lord rebuke you. Now you ask yourself the question, well, that's interesting. But there's one other place where an angel uses that phrase. Mm -hmm. So let's go to Zechariah, mm -hmm. right before the book of Malachi. Second to last book, chapter 3. Verses 1 and 2. So Zechariah chapter 3, the Bible says in verse 1, Then he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord. There is the angel of the Lord again. Mm -hmm. The Malach of the Lord, of Yahweh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And guess who was there? Satan was standing at his right hand to do what? Where to oppose him. Mm -hmm. And the Lord said to Satan, what did the Lord say? <laughs> the Lord rebuke you, Satan. Mm -hmm. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? Now Joshua clothed with filthy garments and was standing where? Before the angel. Then he answered and spoke to those who stood before him saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And he said unto him, See, I have removed your iniquity from you. Mm. Oh, angels so, could do that, right? Yeah. Apparently. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> who, who can forgive sins? But God, but God, except God. Yeah. So the angel of the Lord is in Exodus. The angel of the Lord is clearly here in Zechariah. And he uses in debate with Satan mm -hmm. over a believer in God. So this time it's Joshua. In Jude, it's Moses. Mm -hmm. And Moses is dead. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he says, the Lord rebuke you. We never hear from the devil again. By the way, by the way, let me add this. When Jesus is in the wilderness and Satan comes to him, how does he respond? You shall not tempt the Lord your God. Yes. Who is he talking about? That's right. He's talking about himself. Mm -hmm. Yes. He's talking about himself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he's saying to Satan, you know what I'm saying? Like, get thee behind me. Yes. So the, I think the yes. idea that, oh, well, why would Michael address, you know, the Lord as if, in second person, like he's speaking, oh, it's someone else. Yep. We see it in the wilderness temptation. We see it in Zechariah. I, I, That's I exactly say, right. 
I want to say something um, because this is just this has been powerful already, and I have to say that there's one thing that I think the pastor said that was that there was truth. Mm -hmm. That he said, he said, you Seventh Day Adventists don't even really know what you believe or teach or whatever. Uh, when I when mm -hmm. I say that when I say he was right, I mean all of this ex this. I don't want to say excitement, but nervousness and maybe even fear and anxiety. Like, you know, this pastor is sick, calling us a cult and everybody was afraid. This simple Bible study that you guys have done so far, like just sucks all the oxygen out of what he was saying. Like it was just so simply dismantled very easily. Right. And but people were I mean, I'm going to tell you, our numbers are extremely high. And there's so much interest about this, not because um, people are believing this pastor per se, but they did not know how to show and prove it for themselves. And, and so I just want to yeah. show that. And somebody said, and, and somebody made a comment and they said, well, you know, most Sunday pastors don't, or, you know, of other denominations don't go to seminaries, but they just go to like Bible colleges and they don't have this deeper understanding. I was like, these two gentlemen right here on your screen didn't go to seminary either. It is no. just, it's just Bible study. So I'm trying, I'm using that example to say that all of us should know or be able to teach just the way you guys were able to sit here and, and maybe like in just 30 minutes, simply break this down. It's, yeah. it, it's so clear. Like it's so clear to every, no one is disputing what you're saying in the chat. I'm surely not disputing mm. it. Um, and no judgment to anybody. I mean, I can say that I knew that, that the things that I knew that it was wrong. I didn't know that Daniel part. I mean, Daniel's, I mean, Michael stands up. And so I knew like, okay, that's Jesus. But did I put it all together like you guys have just done right now? No. And so I'm saying the majority of the church, not everybody, but the majority of the church is guilty and, and leaning and depending on people like yourselves. Yeah. And, and not mm. knowing for ourselves how to be able to just be, oh, I can break that down and, right now. And that's the problem. That is the problem. I, I think there's a we lot. We shouldn't of, have been nervous and afraid. Yeah. And there's a lot of Adventists that have left Adventism who still don't know what we believe. No. And that's why they left. Because <laughs> when I hear them explain, this is what Adventists believe, and I'm a, I was an Ad, I'm like, wow, you really never understood. You just mm. didn't understand. And so this is why it is so important, you know, to truly like get into the word of God and understand for yourself. When I hear people saying, you know, I'm a scholar and I know the Bible and da, 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 you know, that's kind of the same thing that was happening in the dark ages. Like only the scholar, only, you know, the, the, yep. the paid evangelist, only the paid preacher could understand the Bible. And what I'm saying, what we're saying is you need to understand for yourself. What we're also saying is, People will take advantage of your lack of knowledge. Yes. And the easiest way to do that again is to say, oh, they're a cult. Yes. Like, like look, there's certain things. It's very hard for me to call anybody like Waco. <laughs> yeah, a cult. You know, um, the yes. guys that went to that, you know, the moon, the, the comets coming yeah. over, a cult. Jim Jones. I believe yeah. that. I was going to say. Yeah, I believe that that. A lot of churches have so many of their doctrines wrong. Well, there's cults out there. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned some. Yeah. There's cults out there. But I'm sure. not going to, you know, I'm not just going to loosely use that word, you know, and just because it's a cop out word. He didn't think he was. He wrote a whole book. Yeah, it, it's a word that's just like, if people think this, then they're not even going to want to hear. They're just going to back off. Nah, you're a cult. You're a cult. And no matter what you say, because people want to protect themselves from a cult, no matter what you say, it's like, nope, you're, you're lying. You're trying to suck me in. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of, to me, it's, it, 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 it reminds me of Revelation 12, 17, that the dragon mm -hmm. is angry and has gone to make war with those who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus, right? These that's attacks right. upon a people who are simply saying, hey, God is love, but God has a law and people who steal, kill, lie, and don't repent from it will face judgment that's heretical. Mm -hmm. Really? What's so heretical about God judging between the righteous and the wicked? And it really leaves <laughs> you scratching your head. Well, all again, this, all of this thing to try to prove we're a cult is simply revolving around our position 
on the law of God. So if they can make it look like we don't really believe in Jesus, then ah, then we don't need to keep the Sabbath. If they can make it look like we yeah. don't have assurance of salvation, oh, then we need, it all really boils down to the commandments of God. And Romans 8, 7, the carnal mind is enmity against the law of God. Mm -hmm. So whatever yep. I need to do to convince myself that I do not need to keep God's commandments, I'm going to call you a cult. I'm going to call you a liar. I'm going to talk about the secret documents that the church has that they're hiding in the basement of the vault that no Adventist knows about, only the pastors. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you got you to gotta look at, you know, it's interesting that we're, we're having a commentary in a Bible study on the Bible study itself. Right. Mm. So what's bringing us together is this fight between Michael and, and Satan. Mm -hmm. It's just being played out on social media. Yeah. Mm. And I think wow. to Atante's point, to say that our people are not grounded in these things is also a rebuke to us that mm -hmm. there needs to be more content created. Mm -hmm. We need to have it out there available for mm. people to do so. Because mm. as I told you, Ivor, when we spoke on the phone, that you're going through the chat, you don't see anybody engaging in that because they're not even in that space, but that's where our young people are. Yeah. Yes. This was the And so the that that to me is a big church, push. Yes, 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 yes. Right, you're that's exactly right. You're absolutely correct. You're absolutely correct. So we, um, we, we have to recognize the great controversy. Satan is going to attack on any battlefield he can, mm -hmm. whether that is in a physical church whether that is in the battlefield of your mind or whether that's in the battlefield of media and mm -hmm. social media and content creation. So mm -hmm. the recognition is the devil can use people who don't even know they're being used. Right. That is a historical fact, as you just called them at the beginning, Saul Ministries. Mm -hmm. So I don't know that I'm being used, but at mm -hmm. the end of the day, the, 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 the concept of Michael standing up for his people that's why I said mm -hmm. this whole context of why we're having this Sabbath school Bible study mm -hmm. is a blessing from God. It is a gift because those who are tuning in by God's grace are getting textual historical information mm -hmm. to walk away and say, look, I'm not crazy. I'm not an occult. And so you might have come in a little bit antsy, but then you leave way more confident yes. mm -hmm. and to say, yes. OK, wow. This, this is not a, if, if we are a cult, then so is Baptists, so are Reformed Calvinists, so mm -hmm. are um, uh, 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 Presbyterian. Mm -hmm. So you basically lump in everybody into the boat. Mm -hmm. But the reality is, as you said, you have to ask yourself the question, why is it so mm -hmm. important to you that we are a cult? Yep. Mm -hmm. Of all the people believe that Michael and Jesus are the same person. Why is it that we don't have an authoritarian, charismatic leader? Mm -hmm. We don't, we don't have this isolationist come hide. In, you can find a seven day Adventist church on Google maps. <laughs> we practice open communion. <clears throat> like where are we hiding you in the basement? We're, hey, we, right. we, we're, we, we listen to the Perry's. We, <laughs> we're listening to people who are not Adventists, right? Right, right, I right. Mean, right. A cult is going to control. Never do that. Would never do that. They're going to control what you listen to. You can't go here. You can't, you know, I mean. Yes. And which church. And, that, how many, and there's yeah. a lot of, there's, mm, well, maybe I'll say that. But this is, this, because this is the fundamental, this is the fundamental thing for me. And I love what you mentioned about the conspiracy theories. Is in the great controversy articulated by Paul in Ephesians chapter six, the whole book of Ephesians Paul's goal is unity together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's the constant word in Greek that he's adding together, together in unity. Mm -hmm. And when he wants to say, here's my strongest argument. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, flesh and blood. Mm -hmm. yep. but against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places. Mm -hmm. So what is the armor of God? None of it is physical. Mm -hmm. None of it is intellectual. Mm -hmm. It is all spiritual. So the recognition is this is that this is a ploy by Satan to bring division among people who should be trying to seek truth together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And to say, listen, brother, I'm not trying to be right. I'm just trying to get it right. Yeah. 
<laughs> and so the, the recognition is, is that Pastor Eric Mason is not my enemy. Mm -mm. So the Perrys are not my enemy. Mm -mm. No, Anybody not. else who's out there naming us as a cult is not my enemy. They I understand as Jesus understood. That's exactly mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. So how can I get brothers and sisters to fight? Because in the mindset of Jesus talking to Peter and Peter said, Lord, you're not going to the cross. Mm -hmm. Jesus said, get thee behind me, Satan. Mm -hmm. That's what he said. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So notice he didn't say, get behind me, Peter. Mm -hmm. He said, mm -hmm. get behind me, Satan. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing. It's to say, no, I see what the devil's trying to do. I got no problem with Peter's. Mm -hmm. Peter's going to continue to walk with me. And then even when Peter's tempted, he said, I prayed for you mm -hmm. because Satan has desired you. Mm -hmm. And he says, the great controversy is now being played out in Peter's life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he says, there when you're converted, strengthen your brethren that your mm -hmm. faith fail not. And I think I'm, I'm, I'm going to read. There was a, <clears throat> a question statement that somebody wrote. Um, it says, but there are. Talk, and this is, I think, pertaining to why some people want to call Adventism a cult, not just because of what we studied today, but some people say, but there are plenty of people who try to control what we watch, hear, wear, or eat. What do you think that looks like to an outsider? And again, but you said that's people. Yeah. That's people. That's not this charismatic mm -hmm. leader or, or of the church or, or whatever. Those are individual people. Um, and one thing that I have to say that really opened my eyes up to uh, just Christianity in general and, and Protestantism, that the that in every church there is an ultra conservative side. I don't care what denomination yep. you're in. Like in this, <laughs> me, becoming a therapist and I, I had clients come in who like they're talking and I'm like, is your, are you a, are you coming from a family that's an ultra conservative family? Because I mean, the, some of the things are sounding kind of similar, but it was a totally different denomination that I hadn't even heard of before. But it was still a Protestant denomination, mm -hmm. just not a mainstream one. But it's just like, I've, and that happened several times. And I was like, okay, every church has a certain wing of it that is going to try to control people in their lifestyle aspect. Um, and yes. so you can't call Adventism a cult because there are some individuals that um, are very conservative and try to tell you what to eat, what to drink, what to wear, and those type of things. You, you can mean, go to some Adventist churches where you're like, nah, I know y'all not Adventists, right? <laughs> really? <laughs> so we, just like every other church, you have your we, have the, get, we have varieties. the spectrum. Yeah. So and why, and why is that? But think about what you just said. And why is that? Because, because there is. Free. <laughs> thank you. That's <laughs> exactly right. Why yeah. would there be a spectrum if it's completely controlled and mandated? The yeah. reality mm -hmm. is, is that, again, the fundamental piece here is to muddy the waters of perception. Yeah. The moment I can do that and I have already considered you guilty to proven innocent. Mm -hmm. It's impossible to have a conversation, which is yep. worse than the disagreement. Yep. Mm -hmm. It's okay. Like I often tell people when you look at the book Song of Songs, Solomon and his and his love often start sections of the book apart, but always end together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I said, that is such a beautiful illustration of relationships. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. My wife and I can enter a conversation and we are apart, but we end together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the recognition is, is that in a relationship, it's okay for us to start apart, mm -hmm. but the goal is to end together. Mm -hmm. yes. And the, the basis of that unity being Jesus and his word, you go into it to say, whatever is going to step into that cycle and say, no, we will never end together. Mm -hmm. I'm not even going to try to make this work. And Atante knows this as a therapist is, is that if you sit down with a couple, and one person says, I'm not willing to do the work to make this relationship work. Mm. There's nothing you can do yeah. because you're like, I'm not going to do the work. And that's yeah. the, that's what we're talking about when we're quoting history and these other denominations and going through the Bible is to say, you have people who are just going to put statements out there, but they're not going to sit down and do the work and mm. say, let me call up Ivor. Let me call up Sebastian. Let me see these people and say, Hey, honestly, what is your belief on this? How do yeah. you see this? Is this true? Nope. Nope. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're not going to do that. You're going to go to the ex-Adventist. 
you're going to try to get your weaponry. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, most of the times, get that weaponry wrong. So now when you're presenting this position, mm -hmm. it's like, wait a minute, that's not our weapon. Like, if it's our weapon, we're going to defend it. Right. But mm -hmm. now you're putting out stuff that's not even our weaponry. And we're like, we never said that. Mm -hmm. We don't believe that. Mm -hmm. That's not true. That, no, no, no. I'll defend what I believe to be true. You don't need to color it or anything. But when you're not even getting the coloring right, mm. when you're not even getting the <laughs> weaponry right, I'm just like, well, where'd you get that? Because that's not our weapon. Right. That's not one of my pieces. Right. So this idea of dehumanizing, I think, is so crucial because, you know, they don't, you don't want to get on the phone. Just, a crowd. I, let's, hey, how about a phone call? How about me and you sit down as brothers, no social media, no nothing, and just me and you. Right. And we're going to go. Right. We're going to talk. We're going to be friends. And as friends, let's discuss this. Let's discuss what the differences are. And you try to understand, you know, my position while I try to understand your position. But mm. yeah, when when that's not the motive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, yeah, I think you're wrong. Atanti, do we have time to look at another verse? Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. We can, yeah. Now, let me say this okay. as you're going there. Is yeah. Remember, guys, that we are... I like how he asked me. <laughs> yeah. We're, <laughs> only, we're only dealing with, one, we're dealing with one issue at a time. And, and this is the key thing I want to say. Look, if, if, if someone's come with something and you're wrong here, what are the odds that you're going to be wrong in your application of other things as well? Mm -hmm. Right? All these points yeah. you're bringing up, if you study those points in the same way that you've you, if your lack of study, same way you, there is lack of study here, what are the odds of that lack of study here spills over into all your other points, mm -hmm. right? So we're not just mm -hmm. focusing on one point. We will go through systematically, here is every, and there are other people that are doing this, ADL, you know, um, powerful ministry on YouTube that is taking a lot of these accusations and addressing them. There are other people that are doing So we're not, you know, by any means, the only ones that are doing it, there are people that are addressing it, but it just, yeah, it, it, it is crucial for us, I think, to understand that sometimes the principles that people use to try to discredit, are just, they're not straight principles. Mm -hmm. They're not across the board. No. Let Sebastian say no. his point, then I want to say something, and then we're going to oh. do a part two. Yeah, okay. Here's what I was going to say. <laughs> Sorry, Sebastian, I'll be dealing with Azazel it's okay. in the sermon. <laughs> I'll be dealing with Azazel, the, the, the description of the scapegoat. Right. Who is that in this sermon? Please, mm. we're, we're going, going to take a break. Start sharing this link because y'all are going to need to hear this. Yes, and I want to say okay. right before, Sebastian, I'm letting you go too. I want to say that this Sabbath school portion, we will... We'll separated. have our mm -hmm. editor separate it right away. So this will be a standalone. So you can share this part and then you'll be able to share the sermon part. Um, we'll, be a, we'll make that a standalone as well. So it, they don't have to That's right. don't have to share the entire uh, church service. But go ahead. Go ahead, Sebastian. Awesome. So I just wanted to go to Revelation 12, verse 7, which is the, the fifth occurrence of Michael in the Bible. So in Revelation chapter 12, verse 7, the Bible says, And war broke out in heaven, and Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So now when we see... Michael, who was called the archangel in Jude, the ruling angel, mm -hmm. the Bible now says it's Michael and his angels mm. fighting the dragon and his angels. Mm -hmm. So these are the two opposing individuals. And therefore, we see Michael is commanding the armies of God. Mm. So there's a war in heaven and Michael is the one who's commanding the army. He's leading the battle. So this is a very interesting thing because when you, when you look at Michael, as we saw in Daniel, that here he is standing up for his people in Daniel chapter 12, in Daniel chapter 10, he's coming to help in conflict with Gabriel fighting the Prince of Persia. Then we, we see him um, in Jude in conflict with the devil over the body of Moses. 
So in looking at these five occurrences, we see that whenever Michael is there, it is because there's a conflict and he's the one who's commanding or he's assisting angels who are fighting. Now, why is this important? Because we talked about the angel of the Lord and who is the captain of the Lord's army. So I want you to go to um, Joshua chapter five, Joshua chapter five in verse 14. So Joshua, right, he's, he's waiting outside of Jericho and as he, he's kind of there, he's contemplating. So it says, beginning in verse 13, and it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho, that he lifted his eyes and looked and behold, a man stood opposite him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, are you for us or for our adversaries? Mm -hmm. So he said, no, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did what? Worshiped. Now in Revelation 19, when John fell down and tried to worship the angel, and it was just an angel, he said, don't do that. I'm your fellow servant. Mm -hmm. But here we see Joshua falls down, he worships, and he says to him, what does my Lord say to his servant? Verse 15, then the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, take your sandal off your foot, for the place where you stand is what? Holy. Holy ground. Where have we mm -hmm. seen that before? Mm -hmm. So now we're going back to Exodus 3, which is the mm -hmm. angel of the Lord, the Lord. appears right. to Moses. He's taking off his shoes. And just to confirm, notice in chapter 6, Joshua confirms that it was God. So it says in verse 1 of chapter 6, Now Jericho was securely shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out and none came in. And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hands, its king and the mighty men of valor. Mm. You should, and then he starts to give. So now he confirms, this is God telling me. This is the mm. Lord who's commanding. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when you and I look at this, and we can actually attach this to Daniel chapter 8 as well. So I just want to go to one more, mm -hmm. uh, to Daniel chapter 8. This is my last verse. So Daniel chapter 8, in the middle of this prophecy, we talk about there's this little horn, right? That's sort of growing exceedingly towards the south and towards the north, et cetera, et cetera. And verse 10, and it grew to the host of heaven and it cast down some of the host and some of the stars to the ground and trampled them. Verse 11, he even exalted himself as high as the prince of the host. Mm. the commander of the Lord's army. And by him, the daily sacrifices were taken away and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. So now we see here's a celestial being who's in heaven, who this little horn power is now exalting himself even to this person who is mm. in the sanctuary mm. in heaven. No. And he's trying to take away the ministry of this individual mm. who's a celestial being, who's also the prince of, of the host. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He's the commander of the Lord's army and he's mm -hmm. the prince of Daniel's people in chapter 10. And he's the one who stands for them in chapter 12. Mm -hmm. So when you, when you look, yes. correct. So the pre-incarnate Christ, we understand who was there with them in the wilderness. First Corinthians chapter 10 says the rock that followed them where the water came out, that was Christ. Mm-hmm. So that means who called Moses and appeared to him in the wilderness? It was Christ. Mm -hmm. Who was the one in Zechariah? It was Christ. Mm -hmm. Who was the one in Daniel? It was Christ. Christ. So in all of these things, he's saying this was Jesus all along. Mm -hmm. And Michael always appears before the incarnation of Christ. You never see Michael doing anything from the moment Jesus was born because mm -hmm. we believe and I believe we have biblical warrant and evidence to suggest our position as Calvin, as Spurgeon, as Matthew Henry, as the Geneva Bible. There's biblical Matthew. reasons mm -hmm. to believe. That's right. That Michael and Jesus are the same person. We're not saying mm -hmm. Jesus is a created being. That's right. right. We're saying the name Michael is giving a reference to Jesus and a particular role. Mm -hmm. And in that role that he has, he's always in conflict with the devil. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
Mm-hmm. And he's the one who's winning. Yeah. This has been, I mean, hey man, this has been so good. This has been so, so good and so clear, so clear. Just no, it's just been so clear. And you'd even help me understand. I've never understood really why Jehovah's Witnesses don't think that Jesus is God, but now I know the yeah. confusion here yeah. takes them there. So this just this has yep. just been amazing. This yeah. has been amazing. And, and um, oh man, we forgot our Ellen White quotes. Oh well, you guys can bring that. <laughs> you remember we have a part no, two. No, no, no. I'm joking. He's man. joking. Oh, He's joking. Oh, He's joking. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> I'm joking. Yes, and I was gonna say that too because there's some people who are. There was someone on in here in the chat that was like, um, you know, Adventists have to use. Spirit of prophecy for everything to what what sure spirit don't. of prophecy did you hear today? None. And Ellen White clearly rebukes that. She was like, No, my writings are not the authority. The Bible is the authority. And everything Correct. that she wrote was from there. That there you mean like there's no her her writings do not trump the Bible. And that's not what Seven Day Adventists teach. Now again. Individuals may do that. And I mean, individuals may be very Ellen White heavy and not give Bible. Yep. That's their mistake mm-hmm. and they, they're wrong for and, that. And they do it. But that is not what the Seventh day Adventist church teaches or promotes. Individuals may that's do right. that. And really, I have to say, that's really laziness. It's easy to just read a quote versus do a study of the Bible. It's obvious that in the Bible, it's obvious. I'm not saying doing a study is hard either, but we even get lazy and just be like, oh, I'm just going to take this quote. There you go. No, that's not what you do. You don't take an Ellen White quote and and try to preach and teach that as this is it. No, you go to the Bible and you have a Bible study. And if Ellen White can can back up what the Bible is saying, that's great. But that we don't take Ellen White and lead with that. That is not what the Seventh-day Adventist um, church teaches. And that's not what we should do. It's true. Amen. So, but those kind of things make people be like, oh, you believe in, you know, you put Ellen White above above the Bible and that, you know, makes you a cult. Yeah. Yeah. That's not what we do. But we're going to (laughs) continue this. We're going to continue this discussion and not about Michael, because you guys have exhausted this very, I mean, people are very, they're very happy in the chat just getting this information. I think the goal was accomplished where they leave more confident. Uh, Sebastian, you talked about that. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that's, you know, you guys share, share, share um, on your social media and with your friends and family. Next week, I mean, since we're just dismantling all these things, Mm -hmm. do you guys want to do investigative judgment? Do you want to do Ellen White's a racist? I think maybe think, maybe well well I just threw that out there maybe you guys pray investigative about it. judgment let's, okay let, yeah, okay let's, let's do the judgment okay but that racist yes. piece, yeah oh, that no, racist no, no. piece oh, yeah. I want to bring that in and I also well, okay I'll tell you after the program what I want to do with that <laughs> but um, so yes okay investigative judgment so guys come back invite even more your friends family because we're gonna keep uh, we're going to keep this discussion. We're going to talk about the investigative judgment. Are we a cult because of this teaching that we believe it from the Bible? So you need to come back mm. and hear uh, or come back to this Bible study and hear what uh, these men pastors have to say <laughs> about, about this topic. Amen. All right. Amen. Well, we have gone... Wow. Yeah, we've gone way over, but way it's, over. But it's okay. But um, because there's yeah. been there's been too much silence for too long. Yeah. Now, I have um, to say. Yeah, we're we're gonna get ready to close this out. Um, please. I I just want to say to all of those that are watching live and that will watch, and I'm sorry to cut you off. Mm-hmm. Um, is that there was people who were like, yeah, we need more of this, meaning teaching our doctrines and these so clearly. I was like. It, I was like, come, come back to Living Man at Church. This is what we do. I mean, we're not always teaching mm-hmm. doctrinal things, but you, you have an evangelism mm-hmm. Sabbath, like at least every, it's supposed once to be a once month. a month mm-hmm. or once every six weeks that, that does a study just like this so that you're hearing these things and understanding mm-hmm. you can go back and do your own study. So if you're new to uh, this channel and to our church and you like this um, conversation that you heard today, come back. Come back because this is what. And we I'm do. just gonna say, y'all, I'm so excited about this sermon coming up on the scapegoat. I think it's gonna blow your minds, and you know I don't say that lightly. 
So um, <laughs> <laughs> be there. Share the link. Be there. Share the link. Don't go anywhere. Yeah. We still Sebastian, thank continue you, to worship with us. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm so glad that your schedule allows you. People were very blessed by what you shared. They're praising God. Oh. Love from Praise the fans that you uh, come from. And sorry about your, your auntie didn't know that piece, but that definitely gives you a perspective. Like this is personal. This is personal. Being For like, sure. You, you For know sure. what a real cult can do. And so you just don't. 1000%. You, you don't just yeah. throw that, that term around. You don't do that. You don't do that. So Not at all. Not at all. Yeah. Praise God for uh, being transparent and letting us, letting us know that piece as well. But thank you. We're going to pray. We can't wait to, for this conversation to continue on to next week. Sebastian, could you pray us out? Sure. Okay. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we are so grateful for the word of God. It is true that it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for instruction in righteousness, that the man or the woman of God may be truly furnished unto every good work. God, you do not teach us about Michael just to argue doctrines, mm -mm. but you teach us about Michael so that we may understand that we have a strong defender in Christ. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. That a mighty fortress is our God, who even when the times of trouble are so bad that there's never been one like it, mm. that Jesus will stand for us, mm -hmm. that we can rest assured that we will be delivered. Mm. God, you teach us this because we are also called to imitate Jesus, mm -hmm. to be one who stands for others, mm -hmm. to be a defender, to fight the battles of the Lord when champions are few. So God, I pray for each person who came here because they were seeking and Christ looks upon the multitude and says, blessed are the poor in spirit for mm -hmm. theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Mm -hmm. So God, I pray that you would feed every single soul in this multitude. Mm -hmm. And God, may we gather up the fragments. May we reflect upon these things. May we not only study and understand, but may we share. Amen. We ask also in a special way that you would pour out your spirit on Ivor's mind as he prepares for this message. Put your words in this man's mouth. And if we ever heard you speak by a man, may it be today. We ask God that we may walk away confident in the God that we serve, in the truths that we believe in the life that you've called us to live. Keep us faithful until you come, and in the word of God is our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen.